Now, the first race was today. The Iowa caucuses held just a few hours ago. And just an update on the results. And there were no results. Uh, that's right. Uh, to give you a sense of what I'm talking about, the front page of the New York Times tomorrow, quote, outright confusion as Democratic results are delayed in Iowa. And the subheading, official site quality control efforts. The quote of the night, I think, comes from Bernie Sanders, who, of course, was favoured to win the Iowa caucuses. Now, we at CIS aren't prone to quoting with approval a socialist, uh, but on this occasion I will, when Bernie says, quote, I'm confident results will be released at some point. <laughs> well, this year's scholar in residence is Doug Bandow. Doug uh, is a senior fellow and has been a senior fellow at the Cato Institute in Washington for the best part of 30 years. Um, he was a special assistant to President Ronald Reagan in the 1980s. Now, for Doug, like many libertarians and classical liberals, and we at CIS would identify ourselves as classical liberal, he believes an ambitious foreign policy inspired by vision and a sense of mission, and you think about the Bush Doctrine in post-9-11, that represents the kind of foreign policy that has been instrumental in building up the power of states throughout history. Now, to hear more about all this, including the IRA results or the lack of them, I'd like to now call on Doug to make a few introductory remarks before we turn to the panel. Please welcome Doug Bandow. Well, thanks, Tom. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's interesting watching the results in Iowa. I worked in the Reagan campaign as well as the administration. I traveled with the campaign to various parts in America. The U.S. has a very unique uh, you know, system. I like the parliamentary system because you call an election, a month or two later, you're done. In the US, you have to listen to these people for two years. <laughs> it is extraordinarily painful, I can assure you. you know, day after day, week after week, election after election. And uh, Ronald Reagan lost the Iowa caucuses. It was a bit of an upset. And he turned that around by going to New Hampshire. And he spent basically every day for a month or the next two weeks, whatever it was, on the bus, 12 hours a day, visiting spots. We're in an odd place because the US system starts out in very unrepresentative you know, states. You know, Iowa is a Midwestern state, it's the middle of the country, <laughs> it's kind of agricultural, it has a populist cast to some degree, it'll elect both Democrats and Republicans, though now it's more of a Republican state. New Hampshire is Northeast, <clears throat> traditionally Republican, a bit more uh, you know, middle of the road these days in terms of, again, we'll elect both sides, but a very different sort of folks there. Iowa's more religious, New Hampshire is not. You know, so these are the places that get the most attention. You know, so these are helping to determine, you know, basically, you know, the sense of what the election is going. Uh, the New Hampshire primary is eight days uh, uh, from now. It's on the 11th, a Tuesday, actually, I guess a week from today. It, uh, Nevada follows. It's another caucus state on the 22nd. South Carolina comes on the 29th, and then it's what we call Super Tuesday. March 2nd, you have Alabama, Arkansas, California, the biggest state in the United States, Colorado, Maine, Massachusetts, Minnesota, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, Vermont, and Virginia all on the same day. So what you find is in the early states, anybody can compete. You can be a small candidate, not very well known, show up and spend you know, as much of your time as you can in both uh, Iowa and New Hampshire, and you hope to build your name. The moment you hit March 3rd, name ID matters, money matters, organization matters, you don't have much time. You're hitting these big states. March 10th has a number of uh, primaries, March 17th. You know, you're getting through and wrapping these things up pretty much by April, you've gotten through the most important and the biggest states. What we see in Iowa today, I think is an embarrassment. I mean, I have to admit it, there are many things that embarrass me. I mean, our president as well as the process. So I try to explain to people abroad kind of how the American political system works. And I have to say, I've enjoyed watching Australian politics. I like parliamentary systems <laughs> where you can knife your opponents. So you call, I mean, I guess there was, you know, the, the National Party this morning had, you know, I love this, where you can just kind of call the election, stab the person you were thrown out last year. You can come back and stab them. I think you had like five prime ministers in five years or something. Nevertheless, that means you can get rid of the idiots uh, and America's kind of stuck with them. You know, so we elect them and you have to put up with them for four years or eight years. And now it turns out even in trying to elect the new one, they can't get it right. 
Now, the caucuses, and what makes Iowa very strange is it's a caucus state. You know, primaries uh, operate, the, you know, I mean, we don't have the kind of, uh, you know, this, I love, you know, the Australian, the second vote kind of, you know, for the other candidate and stuff. That's being, they've tried that in Maine, but it's not uh, across the U.S. Nevertheless, the primaries are fairly straightforward. You show up and you vote for somebody. Now, the caucuses, it's typically much more labor intensive. You really have to want to vote to show up on a cold evening in Iowa on a, you know, you go out there and you show up somewhere and there's a big hall that's filled with people and people stand around with little signs that say Sanders, Biden, and you go over and kind of caucus with your people. And you count them all and you have to be at 15%. And if you're not at 15%, you have to go redistribute yourself. I mean, this is a process that does require commitment and intensity. So less people are likely to do that than to show up and simply cast a vote. So it's a unique self-selection as it is. And that does help people like Bernie Sanders, of the intensity of people who are, who's going to show up for Bernie, the, the believers in Bernie. I mean, if for somebody like Biden, it's less so. I mean, his people are more likely to be kind of middle of the road, average folks, want somebody they're comfortable with, somebody who's been in office, somebody who doesn't seem crazy. You know, are they going to show up and spend your entire evening doing all this strange stuff to elect them? So there, there's that disproportion in, in the sense of how these early elections turn out. New Hampshire is a more normal vote, but then Nevada, a, a particular uh, role there of uh, Harry Reid, who's former majority leader, a major Democrat, and labor unions, Nevada's an interesting state, you know, more likely to go Biden, I think, simply because of underlying organization, as opposed to necessarily the intensity of voters. <clears throat> but we have a, a huge cast of characters running in the U.S. presidential election, I think if nothing, I mean, it kind of goes back to Jimmy Carter with the, the you know, the peanut farmer from uh, Georgia, one-term governor of a small state in the South who gets elected, which convinced everybody that anybody in America really can be president. <laughs> and, you know, if you certainly, if you look at this time, that's brought it out. The candidates who are uh, on the ballot in Iowa include Michael Bennett, who's a Colorado senator most people haven't heard of, Joe Biden, Michael Bloomberg, the 77-year-old, uh, uh, you know, kind of <coughs> magnet who runs the Bloomberg uh, you know, uh, news service, <coughs> Pete Buttigieg, mayor of South Bend, Indiana. It's the fourth largest city in the state. It's a state he could never carry statewide. <coughs> I mean, he's far too liberal to actually carry Indiana. Nevertheless, he's in the race. <coughs> John Delaney, uh, Congressman Tulsi Gabbard, Congresswoman from Hawaii. Amy Klobuchar, who's a, a moderate senator from Minnesota. Uh, Deval Patrick, uh, you know, former governor of Massachusetts, jumped into the race <laughs> a couple months ago after everybody had been in it for a while. Bernie Sanders, Tom Steyer, the billionaire before uh, Bloomberg who decided to run, uh, the uh, Elizabeth Warren, senator from Massachusetts, and Andrew Yang, who's kind of an entrepreneur and you know, an interesting character out there. But before them, I mean, a long <laughs> list of people, Cory Booker, who's a senator from New Jersey, Steve Bullock, who's Montana governor, uh, Juan, uh, you know, Julian Castro, who's a mayor of San Antonio in Texas, the uh, you know, Christy Gillibrand, who's a you know, senator from uh, New York State, Carla Harris, uh, who was uh, the, is the senator from uh, California, John Hickenlooper, a former Cal uh, Colorado governor, John, uh, Jay Isley, or Inslee, from Washington State, current governor, the <laughs> Beto O'Rourke, who was a former congressman who ran for Senate, barely lost the last go around. Tim Ryan, another former congressman. And then there are even some people I wasn't aware of who were running. I mean, uh, it's extraordinary. The, basically, this race brought out more than 20 candidates who've you know, st slowly been winnowed down. And the Iowa process is likely to bring them down further. You know, once you get through, uh, if you get through Iowa and New Hampshire and haven't done very well, if you're down in the 3 4%, you really have no chance. I mean, that's the point where if you've gotten nothing out of those states where you can campaign intensively, the idea you show up on Super Tuesday where you've got 20 states, I mean, you're gone. And then the question, you know, a lot of times people try to stick around because they've invested so much and they keep hoping something good will happen. It rarely does. Nevertheless, uh, you know, you certainly will see some of them hang on. But my guess is after the winnowing of particularly Iowa and New Hampshire, you better be in, say, the top three. Now, Sanders can be helped you know, if he would win both of those going into South Carolina, South Carolina, about two-thirds of the Democratic voters are African-Americans, very strongly Democratic, and tend to be attached to Biden. So Biden's been in the lead, though polls there have narrowed some. So the question is, will these early results, if Biden does un is surprisingly bad, 
and Sanders or somebody else would do surprisingly good, would that affect South Carolina? It could. Then you move into Super Tuesday, and again, the question there is how do you handle all of those, those extra states? I, so, so the results we eventually see, as Bernie Sanders told us, I presume they eventually will be. And I have to say, I don't, I don't understand how you get inconsistencies in data where, I mean, it's a fairly simple counting process. It takes some time, <laughs> but you count how many people are here and how many people are there, and you have a number. I don't quite understand how these become inconsistent unless they're counting, I don't know, you know some people they shouldn't be counting. The, the problem, of course, with this result is, number one, it's, it shows yet again that America's electoral system is embarrassing. I mean, we had the 2000 episode in Florida where we went on for two months trying to figure out who's going to become the, you know, the strongest, most powerful person on earth capable of incinerating the world. And you know, kind of people are doing this, you know, and kind of <laughs> electoral chads and stuff. I mean, it's, then it looks like we may be doing something like the same in Iowa. So <clears throat> where this is all going, trying to predict the result, I think, is very hard. I mean, a Sanders or Warren nomination would be the most radical in the sense that they tend to be the farthest left. It would be the greatest distinction with uh, Trump. And I think it would give him something to play against and give him a real opportunity to win. The view of Biden would certainly probably at this stage be the most difficult for him to beat. Biden has a goofy nature. Nevertheless, he's a decent human being, kind of a mensch, comes from a state of Delaware, which is a relatively small state, people know everyone. His background is an interesting one. He came to, he's been around for 40 years in Washington, but he got elected to the US Senate and then his wife and I think one of his kids were killed in a car accident. He almost never served. I mean, he's a very decent human being. His wife is a teacher. Much harder for Trump to kind of play off of and demonize him. There are several kind of moderate folks in the race. Klobuchar, I mentioned, the Amy Klobuchar, senator from Minnesota. Buttigieg is somewhere in there. Bloomberg, a lot of people think, is coming in in the hopes of a convention where nobody has a majority. Bloomberg has a lot of money, a cold personality, smart guy, ran as a Republican, as a, you know, as a mayor of New York City. A lot of Democrats don't like him. He's another billionaire who needs an old white billionaire. We have, you know, we have enough of these people around. Why elect another one president, you know? <laughs> but he has a lot of money to spend, and he's been spending it. He's been rising in the polls. The Democratic Party, as if to prove uh, you know, Sanders and others' criticisms changed the rules to let him into the next debate. You normally had to have a, a certain number of supporters giving you money as well as at a certain place in the polls. He's self-financing. So they dropped the rule about actually having people giving you money, which allowed him into the race. You know, and again, it, clearly it, they did this only for Bloomberg, who happens to be you know, the new billionaire who came in. This is the kind of thing that I think reinforces the meme that a Bernie Sanders and a, uh, you know, a Warren to some degree and some of the others you know, have been making. It could go to the convention. The convention starts on July 13th. It's been a long time since the U.S. has had a convention which was not decided, or the nomination was not decided ahead of time. You go back a century and it happened quite frequently. You, know, you go there where you have somebody has 30%, somebody 25%, et cetera. You go to the ballots, dickering, trading spots, and it becomes, it can be a very lengthy process. We'll see if that happens out of this. That would be a very interesting result. Probably would not be good for the Democrats. Probably doesn't help them in terms of the November elections. <clears throat> and along with, I just want to throw out that what we're looking at in November is not just presidential election. It's a question of control of the U.S. Senate. The U.S. Senate is very important. It remains under Republican control. It will, in fact, acquit uh, you know, Trump. It uh, looks like on Wednesday they'll have the vote. Where there's some uncertainty about the final vote. Will there be anybody on either side who switches? And there are a couple of possibilities, but it's not clear whether that'll happen. But they control appointments, which is very important. Appointments in terms of just to the administration, but also to judges. If the Democrats took that and if Trump was president, he would be very much in a difficult position if the Democrats hold both houses of Congress and if they can control appointments. So that's going to be an issue. The Republicans have a three-seat margin. It's 53-47. There are a number of vulnerable seats out there. 23 seats are up for election. A lot of them are held by Republicans. Some of them are held uh, you know, in states which they're kind of nervous about whether these will go for Trump. So that's kind of a backdrop here, which matters a lot in terms of presidential nominees. You want a positive and, and a presidential nominee, you want somebody who gets a, a lot of votes. You know, if you get somebody who's extreme, you can lose your Senate candidates because it's a statewide race as well as your presidential nominee. So that's going to be a bit of a backdrop here. My guess is that if Sanders does well in Iowa and New Hampshire, there's going to be a desperate attempt by the Democratic elite to stop him. 
and they will do anything, almost anything, that they can in terms of rejiggering the rules, like you let Bloomberg in or other things, because from their standpoint, they are horrified. And in many ways, for the Democratic Party elite, it might be worse if he won than if he lost. Because if he won, he takes control of the Democratic Party machinery. It's kind of like Trump. Trump winning means he gained control of the Republican Party and he's turned it into the Trump Party. I mean, I mean, almost anyone who's opposed to Trump is gone from any responsible role within the Republican Party. For the Democrats, in many ways, Sanders would be seen the same way. That if Sanders would win, I mean, that would be horrifying because then all of your friends are going to be out of their nice positions. You won't have any influence. He's going to bring in all of his folks, much more to the left, pushing very hard on issues you don't believe in. So the struggle within the Democratic Party is a very serious one in terms of direction. The energy, young activists tend to be for Sanders, my guess is that there's a larger chunk of people, much more moderate working people. I mean, Biden does well among African Americans. He does well among you know, blue collar workers, working people and others. I think he has a lot of support there. The question is intensity. He doesn't have the intensity Sanders in particular does. Warren had a bit of that, but she's well behind Sanders these days. This is gonna be a very interesting contest. And of course it matters hugely, not just in the US, but the rest of the world. It's one of the aspects of the fact that for whatever, whether good or ill, the United States does remain the dominant, most powerful nation on earth, which means the U.S. president could do an awful lot more harm, or one could hope good, you know, in terms of policy than many other leaders. I'm not sure how this is going to turn out. I'm certainly hoping for better in the future, but I'm not going to make any claims to it. Thank you. First, your response to the debacle today. Well, it is the worst debacle for transmission since the uh, Dallas police endeavoured to convey leave Harvey Oswald from their basement garage. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is damaging, it is embarrassing, and it simply reinforces the argument for the United States to have a uh, thoroughly professional uh, electoral service at both a national and a, uh, and a state level. And uh, to take the point that uh, Doug made about hanging chads and so on, a professional electoral commission would have avoided that in Florida too in 2000. Okay, but going into this uh, caucus, Bernie Sanders, uh, the senator from Vermont, was widely seen as the favourite to win these caucuses. As Doug mentioned, he's very much the anti-establishment candidate in the Democratic Party. Could he be forgiven and his supporters be forgiven, Garana, for thinking this is the establishment's way of conspiring against him? <laughs> well, certainly we've seen that in 2016 there's been a lot of that um, pushback against the Democratic Party establishment over uh, the whole handling of the primaries. Then um, Iowa was actually neck and neck between um, Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton. I think it was 49 point something versus 49 for something uh, or thereabouts. So um, certainly I think with each passing minute of um, those results being up in the air fuels further kind of conspiratorial thinking about whether, you know, Bernie actually swept the state and now they're trying to somehow uh, pick up the pieces. But it's also been really interesting now uh, to just watch Twitter feeds of all of the uh, um, front runners who have all proclaimed that they're winning and they're uh, going victorious into the New Hampshire primary. So basically, everyone's a winner. And uh, yeah, it's sort of like elementary school, you know, like you get <laughs> yes. a star for participation. <laughs> <laughs> but there are a lot of doubts about Bernie Sanders, uh, April. Um, and I'll pose a question that's often been raised. Can a socialist who honeymooned in the Soviet Union, who, who just survived a heart attack and would be 80 years old in his first year in office, can he be elected president of the United States? Well, we're seeing that anything is possible. Uh, <laughs> certainly in days past, that wouldn't have, have been a viable candidacy. But now with him leading in some polls, um, we, we are seeing that he could be the anti-Trump. And that would be an amazing race because Trump would love to run against Sanders or Warren. He could put capitalism against socialism mm -hmm. and it's the perfect kind of distinction for him. So He's, he's probably looking forward to a Bernie candidacy. Yeah, and in fairness to Sanders, although, as Hillary Clinton says, nobody likes him, 
which is, you know, obviously disputable, he has a large and dedicated loyal following, particularly, and I think this is very important, among millennials. So about a year or two ago, CIS uh, commissioned some polling research on millennials in this country. So these are people who were born between roughly 1980, 82 and 1996, 98. So they're in their 20s and 30s. These polls, by the way, reflect attitudes across Britain and indeed in the United States. Overwhelming plurality of millennials support socialism, which of course is Bernie Sanders' rallying cry. So doesn't he have a lot going for him if he's got a pretty significant constituency behind him? Doug. Oh, okay. Well, I think that what you've got here is a perception more than reality. I mean, Bernie Sanders is not a socialist. I like to point out he's a millionaire with three homes. I, keep, I want one of his houses, right? I mean, if we're going to socialize assets, can I have one of them? Um, the, the point is, he's, he's a redistributionist. I mean, he actually likes capitalism for devil, delivering a lot of money. I mean, his, his campaign is not to nationalize the means of production. I mean, you don't hear him saying the government should take over anything. What he wants is to spend money. And he's made a lot of proposals in terms of you know, you know, college education, in terms of health care, and a number of other things. He, would spend, he was asked how much it would cost, and he said he had no idea, which is an interesting <laughs> position for a presidential candidate to take. But I think that what he's uh, responding to is a frustration with economic growth, a perception of in income inequality, unfairness, I mean, the kind of perversion of markets through political elites. When you go back to 2008 with the financial crisis, who gets bailed out? You know, who gets, I mean, all these sorts of things are very clearly very, and I think that's gave him an enormous amount of power when he ran last time. I mean, Hillary Clinton was seen as the candidate of the elite. This is someone who speaks to Wall Street for hundreds of thousands of dollars. She's probably not talking about helping poor people. There's probably something else in her message, and she wouldn't tell anybody what she said. She wouldn't release you know, the transcript of the proceedings. So he, in many ways, Sanders is running as much against the elite of the Democratic Party as the Republican Party. The sense of corporations have taken over, the sense of you know the the wealth of Wall Street, the you know, you know the the whole question of you know t you know the the new internet elite and whatnot who tend to be Democrats, you know all of these. So that's I think a very strong appeal. I think the problem is I don't think it's a majority appeal. I mean I, I think that trying to make that work, you know, in terms of Trump, it gives something Trump to work against in a way that he doesn't have to work against somebody who's more centrist. And I think the critical difference between a Biden and a Clinton is Biden may be as comfortable with rich Democrats as Hillary Clinton was, but it's not as obvious. It doesn't come across the same way. It does, the, the visual is very different. The atmosphere is very different. Where he seems much more approachable, than, it, than that I think it's harder for Sanders to make the case. Would you, how would you distinguish, say, Bernie Sanders from, say, the other socialist, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, whom Boris Johnson trounced last December? Well, I mean, it's always dangerous to try to take I mean, comparing, I mean, you know, people have made a comparison actually to the election here. And the question is, is this good for Trump? Unexpectedly, you know, Morrison wins. You know, does that suggest that there's unexpected strength for Trump? And there may be an element of that, but I'm always, I think it's always very dangerous to try. There are so many differences between, you know, countries. I mean, I think Corbyn, <laughs> among other things, Corbyn had a, the, the stench of anti-Semitism in a way that, I mean, Sanders is, is, is a Jew. Now, he's, he is much more pro-Palestinian, concerned about Palestinian rights, but he's Jewish. I mean, it's much harder to hit him with that kind of a charge than, Cor I mean, and it, Corbyn ran the party, so it's, you can blame him for a lot of things happening, what is being said by the deputy leader and others, you know, you know the back benches, you know, the shadow cabinet and whatnot, in a way that Sanders can dismiss, I think, you know, all of that. Uh, in terms, I mean, Corbyn, I think, really was a socialist. I mean, talked about renationalization. I'm not convinced that millennials want to see the U.S. government run auto industry or something. I mean, I think they want more money. They want more economic opportunities. That's a very different argument. Corbyn Universal health care, for example. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I think, I think Corbyn looked for, in many ways to, to a past that still looked relatively discredited in a way that Sanders is only going part way despite his... Well, Garana, how do you account for the success of Bernie Sanders? 1996, of course, he was... Well, 19... Sorry, 2016, 15, he was an independent. He wasn't even a member of the Democratic Party, and he nearly knocked off the queen of the liberal establishment, certainly one in New Hampshire. How do you account for his success over the last few years? So both Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump in 2016 were a symptom of something being perceived as wrong with the whole structure of the U.S. economy and now putting forward solutions which are 
in different ways kind of tackling with these structural issues. That's the first thing. Um, Bernie Sanders capitalized on some of the, the movement that was there has already been kind of mobilized around the uh, 2011 uh, Occupy Wall Street and the kind of cognate protests. And then he basically set the agenda on two things, uh, one of them Medicare for all, the other thing uh, around education, accessibility to education, uh, so free uh, colleges, community community colleges, public universities, et cetera, et cetera. And I think really uh, is um, rallying support um, on the sort of perception that the millennials are going to be the first generation that are going to be worse off uh, net kind of in real terms than their parents. And this is striking a chord. Uh, and again, I think you're right to point out that this is not just endemic to the United States. This is something that's been a uh, feeling shared by millennials um, who are now, you know, uh, uh, very much the, the sort of, um, I, get, I guess, lab rats of the gig economy. And it's always kind of this um, romantic portrayal of, oh, oh, the millennials can't commit to anything. They're so cool, like just changing jobs all the time and, you know, enjoying this sort of precarious status. It's not that. It's just basically the economy is changing. And I think that Bernie Sanders in some of the solutions that he's offering, um, without actually explaining, and this is one thing that we have to bear in mind that in the Democratic primary, both he and uh, Elizabeth Warren, um, senator from Massachusetts, have advocated similar sort of policies, but Bernie Sanders is actually much more skillful in his populist messaging than Elizabeth Warren, who is a Harvard professor who needs to have a plan for everything, and then go out and explain how exactly is she going to uh, find those trillions of dollars to actually make Medicare for All work, and then actually get uh, a lot of pushback, because these are really expensive and draining programs programs that, uh, again, if we think about the median voter, uh, aren't as palatable. And frankly, for some of the people even uh, who are Democratic supporters who have good health care plans through unions or which are now very kind of, you know, not, not a huge share, but um, still are problematic because they do, do want that, for instance, option and having Medicare call for all, or the public option being just an option, not uh, a man mandatory thing. So I think it's a combination of, of several things, but really it is uh, about um, setting agenda on things that strike a chord uh, with the emerging generation. Yeah, so he's orders. resonating with the younger generation, Stephen Loosely. Let's have one final question about Bernie Sanders, because he hasn't won the nomination yet, even though he was favourite today and still remains favourite uh, to win in New Hampshire. Uh, the centre-left think tank Third Way just in the last week put out a, a major paper and they warned that a Sanders nomination risks a Democrat rout in November of the magnitude of the 49 state losses of George McGovern to Richard Nixon in 1972 and uh, Walter Mondale in 1984 against Ronald Reagan. So do you agree with that assessment that if he wins a nomination, the Democrats will get smashed? Yes, I do. And I remember both routes, if memory serves me well, I think George McGovern only carried Massachusetts and the District of yes. Columbia. But as for Bernie Sanders, a couple of comments. Firstly, I actually find Larry David's portrayal of Bernie on Saturday Night Live far more convincing than Bernie himself. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, L L Lindsay, Lindsay Graham is right, and I don't often agree with the distinguished senator for South Carolina, but his observation that Bernie went off to honeymoon in the Soviet Union and never came back <laughs> is, is absolutely on the money in terms of Bernie's thinking about the role of the state. And it's, it's, it's not an ownership role, but it is an interventionist role. And it's having the state pick up the tab for uh, realities, for burdens like student debt. Well over a trillion dollars, but the Sanders campaign simply says it will be forgiven. There will be Medicare for all. Now, Vice President Biden did an analysis in one line of Elizabeth Warren's uh, argument for Medicare for all. And he said, over 10 years, this will cost the American taxpayer $35 trillion. That's all he said. But I mean, it's devastating when you actually look at it in real terms. Final comment, Tom, about uh, Bernie Sanders. There is a very dark side to his campaign, extremely dark, called the Bernie Bros. And the Bernie Bros are fanatic Sanders people 
who turn up at the rallies of other Democrats and harass people coming in and going out, they troll other Democratic candidates, all of them. And so this does not augur well for a uh, okay, but United Party to be fair, though, four November. years ago, many commentators were saying the same thing about one Donald J. Trump and his campaign. I don't think there is any uh, serious com comparison beyond populist imperative between Sanders and Trump. Sanders can't cut through to a broad sensation and underpinning anger in sections of the electorate the way Trump can. April. Uh, what, what do you make of this? I mean, is Sanders, uh, is, is he unelectable? Which is essentially what Stephen's saying. Uh, yeah, I think that if we see Sanders coming out ahead in these four election in these four caucuses and primaries in February, then um, it will be wide open, and the Democrats that would be fantastic for Bloomberg because he would be seen as kind of the the antidote for going way too far left. It could work for Biden, but you know if he's if he's already had troubles in um, Iowa, New Hampshire. Um, uh, Nevada and South Carolina, then then he could be dead in the water. But I do think that it would be very alarming for the Democratic elite, as as Doug was saying. But there's no denying that the young people really find something appealing about the idea of socialism. Maybe it's because they're so far removed from the reality of it that, that it sounds, sounds appealing. But I think that it would be quite a wake-up call to people and, and it would not go well. So who then, Doug, is the, 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 uh, the Democrat Party's best chance of defeating uh, Donald Trump in November? Because, as you pointed out, he's pretty vulnerable in the sense that his approval rating has struggled to get above 45%. So who's the best Democrat presidential candidate? It's, you know, it's hard to know who's going to appeal. I think the most appealing candidates tend to be the ones with the least support. Uh, I mean, the problem with Bloomberg, I mean, you know, he... He is a 76-year-old billionaire, a, a quasi-Democrat, more or less, sort of, who has, you know, who has a number of positions that are not in sync with the hard leftists. That is good for moderates, but it, you know, the intensity is not there. Nobody, and he's a very cold fish. I mean, I've met him. He actually was doing briefings on foreign policy. A very smart guy, bringing in different perspectives. He brought three of us in to talk about Syria. I mean, and we just had a conversation along with a foreign policy aide of his. He asks very smart questions. He's sm he knows the issues. He's intelligent. I mean, on the intellectual level, he'd be a very solid person. But he's a very cold fish and not hostile. But there's no empathy. There's nothing communicated that people like. <clears throat> and, and that's where I think Biden is different and Biden has an advantage. Again, Biden is not somebody you imagine sitting in some high tower in New York City. <clears throat> he's a guy you imagine at the barbecue you can talk to or something. I think Chloe Booker uh, of Minnesota. I mean, she's a, you know she's gotten elected in a, a swing state. Minnesota can go both ways. Trump almost carried it last time. They're targeting it this time. She is more moderate. She works with Republicans. I think that you know, I mean you know she has the advantage. I think in this case of being a woman, it kind of adds something of you know. But she has that moderate cast in terms of position. She doesn't have the baggage that Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton is a very smart person, but a lot of controversies going back to when her husband was governor. There's a long history there, which I could go into and I won't b bother you with, which made it very easy for people to dislike her and not want to vote for her. Chloe Booker really has, has none of that. So I think she would be one. Buttigieg is an interesting, he's pushed a little left on positions. He's gay, he's married, he's I think 37, uh, served in the military. I mean, there again, there's some of the background I think is useful, you know, especially being in the military, he's, you know, He's not as much of a Sanders, you know, kind of non-interventionist. Nevertheless, he's skeptical of some of the Middle Eastern wars. He has credibility. Trump plays the great patriot, but of course wasn't able to serve <clears throat> during Vietnam because of, I don't remember what it was, some bone alleged... Bone spurs. Yeah, bone spurs. That's right. Some, you know, these kind of questionable diagnoses that rich, uh, you know, kids of rich people got. That Doug um, Buttigieg, I think, could be one. I mean, he's well-spoken. I think an interesting, the interesting thing with him is he's the candidate of older people, not younger people. Yeah. Younger people want Sanders. You know, <laughs> older you know, within the Democratic Party like him, they're comfortable with him. Younger people want the activism from Sanders, which is an odd, kind of, you know, odd way around. I think that both of those would be uh, you know, kind of potentially, uh, you could imagine them on a ticket together. I think that could be a very strong ticket. Don't you Doug, think there'd have to yeah. be a woman as the vice presidential candidate? Sorry but, to jump in. No, no my, my reaction is a, a Chloe Booker-Buttigieg ticket, but whoever was 
at the top would be a strong ticket because it brings together two people who are accomplished, well-spoken, more moderate image, their diversity. I mean, they, there's a lot, I think, within that. Neither of them strikes me as scary, so they'd be a good match, different parts of the country, different appeals, and I think they'd be a good match. Okay, so Doug says the Democrats can beat uh, Trump with the right candidates or mix of candidates. Gorana, let me run a, a Wall Street Journal news story by you. Uh, this is just a few days ago. Quote, the world's business elite is convinced that President Trump will win a second term in the White House in November, and investors seem to believe there is little risk they will end up victims of the US election. Gorana. Well, they must have a great crystal ball which tells them everything <laughs> they need to know, and so they should then put, um, yeah, all their that money. You know, money. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's extraordinary when you think that he has never been a majority president. As I said, he's struggled to beat 45% approval rating, hasn't he? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to imagine what Donald Trump would be doing different if he was actively trying to lose the next election. It's kind of weird to think about all the kind of faux pas and things that we've uh, been w witnessing over the past three years. But um, certainly um, Donald Trump has figured out that his way to the White House or to re-election is not by broadening the base, but basically by exploiting the merits of the Electoral College, which obviously now, given the sorting or um, the self-sorting of the electorate into to kind of urban, urban and rural, rural divides sort of um, gives him that advantage. So he can win uh, by not actually winning the majority votes, uh, given the, the fact that, that, that Republicans are uh, more or less in control of uh, all those states that aren't on the coast, um, give or take, take one or two. And then obviously adding uh, the infamous Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. So um, in terms of, I mean, just in, in terms of Trump and, and his re-election, um, what we are likely to see tomorrow when the president gives the State of the Union speech is really this sort of laundry list of what he feels are the administration's <coughs> achievements, uh, mainly in terms of the economic and trade policy. So the health of the economy, where where. He He's certainly going to underscore, you know, the the ongoing growth, despite what he said in Davos are the kind of doomsay, doomsday sayers and prophets and so on. I think for Democrats, this is the major challenge to actually push back against this sort of rhetoric. Um, yes, the growth has been strong. Uh, it hasn't quite been the 4% that he promised, but it, it has been around 2 to 3%. Unemployment is at 3.5%, which is a record low, though granted Again, when he stepped into the office, it was already under the natural uh, natural unemployment rate of 5%, so somewhere around 47 in 2017. Um, but also, I, I think for the, the Wall Street uh, Journal readers and uh, those people that have penned uh, uh, how confident they are about his re-election, he has delivered on the promise of the um, corporate income tax cut cuts, and um, so that went down from 35 to 21 percent, uh, made Wall Street very happy. The median income is is uh, uh, kind of growing, but again, this is a recovery that we've seen still under the Obama years. And now there's been this flurry of various trade deals or agreements that have been either redesigned or, uh, um, you know, revamped or kind of getting out of the the, the height of the trade war with China, which is still kind of up in the air. But, you know, USMCA is a kind of uh, reimagined NAFTA. Uh, some of the trade deals with Japan or South Korea are uh, underway. Um, and those are the things that he will most certainly run on, along with then some of the other things, which I'm sure we'll touch on immigration. And, and, our and April Gorana mentioned policy. the booming economy. It has been booming, hasn't it, in the Trump era? I've got some figures here. Um, record low unemployment. It actually has come down 3.5%. That's the lowest since man went on the moon more than 50 years ago. More women in employment than men. Record low unemployment of African Americans, Hispanics, Asian Americans and veterans. Surely that's a good record to run on. Yeah, and he, he will point to that. He'll point to the promises kept in terms of the economy, the judges he's appointed, the, the trade deals that he has, has pulled out of or, or instigated, and, and the optimism that people are feeling. The misery index is incredibly low. 80% of people think their families are going to be better off this year than they were last year. People are feeling quite good. The, the new home starts are, are going to be very high. So he's going to be pointing to that, while the Democrats will be saying, that's how we are right now, but how fragile is the economy? How can we keep up this incredible, this extraordinary stimulus that has been going on throughout 2019? 
with with the spending and the tax cuts, and that is not going. To, that that's not we're not going to be continuing to see three rate cuts in one year from the Fed. Those kinds of things are going to stop, and that that's where the tension's going to come in. But he'll certainly be pushing on that. Doug, uh, what does all this mean for free traders like the Center for Independent Studies and the Cato Institute? We were warning that Trump's trade protectionism, it didn't trigger a recession, it would certainly lead to an economic downturn. These figures indicate a pretty bullish economy. So are we free traders wrong? And Trump right? No, I think the, the problem here, like a $20 trillion economy is affected by many things. There are a number of studies that have come out that have indicated very seriously that the, the uh, you know, trade war with China, but particularly that a lot of the other policies out there have been harmful to the economy. It's just other things have overwhelmed those effects. I mean, the U.S. manufacturers have had a lot of trouble that companies have closed down. There are a lot of examples of companies that have faced much higher prices on steel. They, can't, they cannot compete overseas, so they can't trade. So the effects are there. Uh, farmers have been hurt. The reason farmers are for him is he increased bailouts for farmers. And the big part, kind of the only part of the deal with China that seems certain is China's promise to buy a lot of agricultural products. Not at all clear any of the very serious structural issues, which are serious, are really taken care of. That's why we'll eventually get to that. And my guess is nothing much will ever happen. Well, I was going to say, who in Washington these days is talking about the deficit and the debt, which has skyrocketed? Because remember five to ten years ago, the Tea Party in Congress made this a big issue. Where are those voices today? Oh, I mean, they're completely gone. I mean, the one thing that both parties agree on is to spend and spend wildly. Uh, the, but I mean, that's the, been since Bush. Yeah, but, but the, we, we are off the charts now. We are talking about, I mean, the trillion U.S. dollar deficits without <coughs> the financial crisis. The last time the U.S. had a trillion dollar deficit was 2012, coming, the final year of coming out of the financial crisis with all the bailouts and everything. So, you know, Barack Obama, under normal circumstances, held the deficit well below that. The U.S. will have a trillion dollar deficit. It had a trillion dollar, de almost trillion dollar deficit last year. It'll be over a trillion dollar this year. Congressional Budget Office has put out its estimates for the future for the next decade every year. Will be and Trump's response was, well, who cares about that? You know, so the, the pretense that there's any, I mean, Republican interest, I mean, that long the Republicans pretended to be concerned about fiscal responsibility. I mean, they don't even pretend anymore. And the Democrats, as you say, are bigger spenders. Uh, April, you're obviously very well connected in the business community in both uh, America and in Australia. Do you think there'll be a day of reckoning for the US economy if these, uh, uh, this debt and deficit issue is not addressed properly? Yeah, well, there is a, a concern that the economy is being propped up. Um, and we have to just just look at what's happened here in Australia with the coronavirus and the drought and the bushfires, how fragile these economies can be. I think that's a real wake-up call to, um, to, to other industrialized countries like ours. So it's going well right now, but business is looking for stability. They, they are predicting a Trump win, but there are so many things that could happen globally in terms of climate change or, or global health pandemics that could severely impact the economy that I don't think it can be taken for granted. Stephen, I mentioned African-Americans, lowest unemployment in living memory. We've had three opinion polls in the last few weeks. Emerson, Maris, Rasmussen. They say that Trump registers about 30% support among black votes, which is very high. Usually, I think it's something between 8 and 12% that vote for Republicans at the presidential level. They say 30%. Now, if that's overblown, say it's 20%, that's still a pretty significant boost for Trump. No, it is. It is. Uh, uh, there's no... Uh question to have more African-American votes in your, uh, in your column when you're going into a poll in Philadelphia, for example, really helps you. I'm not sure that those poll uh, figures will crystallise in a general election. Much will hinge upon whom the, the Democrats actually uh, nominate. But the economy is the wave that, uh, that Trump surfs at the moment and will continue to surf. And if the US economy continues to motor along, there is no reason why he won't be re-elected. It's the reason he's the favourite at the moment. But I just make this point in passing, Tom. I come back to your 45% approval rating for, for Trump. With most presidents with an economy as strong as the current American economy, the president would be sitting on 52, 53. 
Yeah, and on that note, Garana, um, one of the reasons why some seasoned experts of Washington politics think that Trump's so vulnerable is because of his toxic polarisation, his public statements, his attacks on individuals, um, his failure to conform to familiar presidential decorum, if you like. That has upset the sensibilities of a lot of moderate Republicans, college-educated women in the suburban swing metropolitan seats uh, in towns like Philadelphia and Dallas. So... Is there, a, is there a danger here for Trump that he might lose those moderate Republicans? Just say that, just like, in a way, Scott Morrison lost a lot of the safe Liberal voters in metropolitan seats in Sydney and Melbourne. Yeah, that's the story of the 2018 midterms that basically, you know, the unprecedented uh, uh, turnover. And now we are seeing a, a huge number of actually resignations or dis decisions for a lot of Republican representatives to spend a lo lot more time with their families rather than, you know, uh, run for re-election are indicative of this, especially in those suburbs of major metropolitan centers. So, um, absolutely. Now, there is this sort of counter-argument to say, well, you know, 2018 midterms were a bit different because obviously Trump wasn't running. He still might, you know, we shouldn't underestimate uh, the, the sort of power and the draw that he has, the, um, something that, that uh, um, Senator loosely referred to earlier, the, this sort of ability to mobilize people. Uh, but certainly it's a liability. And he, I mean, to just kind of push back around, against some of the conventional wisdom that, you know, the 2018 midterms were really kind of the reflection of the party going full, you know, to the left, Democratic Party that is going really to the left. And, you know, you have these sort of prominent figures like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, Ayanna Presley, and, and some of these other uh, uh, more um, maybe uh, publicized figures. But um, those that really carried uh, the majority of votes were in the so-called purple districts, and this is where Trump should be more concerned, and this is why Joe Biden is this sort of more moderate, um, again, conventional wisdom. We can't make predictions, but certainly th that's the sort of narrative. This is where Joe Biden really has the advantage as a humble guy from Scranton, yeah. Pennsylvania. And now's as good a time as any to say that uh, our guest speaker, who's giving our keynote annual address in early June, will be George Will, the distinguished Washington Post columnist. He's been writing two columns a week, can you believe it, since 1974. It's extraordinary. But Will, of course, was a leading conservative supporter of Reagan's, but in more recent times he's been a leading cr conservative critic of Donald Trump. And it, it reminds me that there are a lot of mainstream conservatives who can't stomach Donald Trump. And the question here is, Doug Bandau, are we seeing a political realignment in countries like America, uh, Britain and Australia where the so-called centre-right candidate, like a Trump or a Boris Johnson or a Scott Morrison, are winning over significant segments of the working class, uh, working base, uh, but at the same time upsetting the more traditional conservative uh, safe voters. I think to some degree that is the case. I'm not sure that, I, I mean, I'd hesitate, I'd hesitate uh, comparing Morrison or even Johnson to Trump in certain ways in that they strike me as more intelligent, more knowledgeable. I mean, Trump has gut instincts that I think he can resonate. He has an appeal to people. I think some of his, where he wants to go on some issues, he, he kind of gets it. But beyond that, there's virtually nothing. I mean, in terms of actually knowing beyond that, you know, it, it's not well, there. Hang on, to be fair to Trump, he has resonated with a lot of yes. working class, no, no, blue collar voters but, but, uh, in states that don't usually vote but Republican. That, that's why I'm ha I, I do think you want to be careful with the comparison. I mean, it just strikes me. I mean, Boris Johnson was in Brussels, wrote a column. I mean, he may be utterly unprincipled, you know, in terms of what he thinks, whether, whether it was he really for Brexit. I mean, give, who knows? But I, I think that there's a difference with him than Trump. I mean, I think that, but I think you're seeing that kind of cleavage and shift. Part of it, is a question of failing industries, it's a question of lost jobs, it's a question of a feeling. I mean, within the US, there are clearly folks whose view is it doesn't matter who we vote for, but say immigration continues to go ahead or other issues <laughs> that Trump spoke to them. And he was able to reach, I mean, I have friends who are very, relatively high level labor Democrats, for example, in Pennsylvania, they voted for Trump yeah, because they had lots of reasons not to like Hillary Clinton that went back many years. And to me, this is where, who you run against is so important. I mean, a Johnson versus somebody other than Jeremy Corbyn 
I mean, you might have had a different result. I mean, and I think that Trump, had he not been, I mean, it would have been interesting to have seen his race against a more moderate Democrat who didn't have her baggage. I think he could have lost. I mean, it, he, he resonated and he pulled people, but it was very easy for him. To, I mean, on issues like abortion, it matters in the United States. Hillary Clinton essentially came out for no limits on abortion, even late term, even viable fetus, pull out at the last day you kill it in a way that Trump played against that. And that's an issue that uh, gained Catholic support of people who are saying, whoa, it's one thing to say moderate, you know, have a moderate position, recognize the difficulties of this decision. It's quite another thing to take a very extreme and Democratic parties move that way. Stephen, loosely, the Labor Party, your party, went backwards in working class seats in northern Queensland, western Sydney, northern Tasmania. Uh, we saw in Britain... Uh, the northern, the uh, the red the red wall of uh, of Labor constituencies in the Midlands and Northern England was smashed by a Tory and Boris Johnson, and as Doug just mentioned, Trump did very well on a lot of those working class electorates in states like Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, um, Michigan, Ohio, and and conceivably in Minnesota. So, are we seeing a political realignment here? It's possible, uh, but it really is uh, is based on a perception that the party of traditional support, be it in the uh, north of England, in the uh, Midwest, in the upper Midwest, be it in the western suburbs of Sydney, North Queensland, that the traditional party, which has uh, enjoyed support over the generations, is seen to have abandoned those communities. It may not have happened, but they're seen to have abandoned those communities. And then you have flashpoints, for example, in the Australian context, the Bob Brown Adani caravan. In the American context, uh, Hillary Clinton's uh, announcement that she'd be shutting lots of coal mines. I mean, very and the deplorable uh, comment. Very, very, very helpful when you're trying to win votes <laughs> in, uh, in those states. Uh, and the mere endorsement of Jeremy Corbyn was a uh, uh, was a circumstance for the British Labor Party where the concession speech should have been prepared before the general election. <laughs> uh, an, an absolute nightmare. So re those realignments occur, but they have to come in a way, Tom, whereby one party sees the advantage of an opening of its opponents having abandoned or being seen to abandon traditional constituencies, which is why I just make this point. I actually have a view that Donald Trump may prove to be less interesting to us than what Trump has tapped into in terms of the constituencies in the United States and what follows him. I noticed that Mike Pompeo was now trying to out-Trump Trump, whereas if the Republicans turn to a figure of consequence, in my view anyway, like Nikki Haley, it might see the party re-centre. So I think that's going to be quite fascinating post-Trump. Political realignments, Gorana. Yeah, I would just say that we need to take a more long-term and, and kind of historic view to this. This isn't something that started in 2016. Um, you know, by all kind of accounts, it started in 68 already. The sort of um, idea that voters don't necessarily vote with their pocketbooks anymore, but more around some values as well. And there, there have been plenty of, you know, the kind of popular books like What's the Matter with Kansas? Or, you know, these days, this sort of idea that um, yes, there is much more of this kind of amygdala sort of response, you know, how, how does a candidate make you feel rather than what is that candidate um, going to do for you necessarily? And does that candidate speak this sort of language that um, you are more likely to respond to rather than these sort of foreign uh, fire removed elites somewhere um, who, who haven't gotten out of the Beltway, and I don't mean that with any sort of uh, offense here, you know, for someone who works in a Washington think tank, but I, I think that there is some something um, something there, and I don't think that this is necessarily just Donald Trump. Um, this has been going on for far longer, but it's just a matter of different candidates, and this is where this sort of phenomenon of, um, you know, Barack Obama uh, voters in Iowa switching to Donald Trump comes from as well, that you do have candidates that are able to come out and present themselves as out, as coming from outside of the, the system and that are able to, to kind of reach and um, speak to those that feel that they've been left out and that haven't been catered to by their party. We'll take questions very soon. I was just going to say, uh, April, um, 
Gorana mentions that values is not a new phenomenon, obviously. That's a good point. But what about woke capitalism? Because this seems like a new uh, phenomenon. Can you tell us more about woke capitalism in the American context? Well, yeah, that was something that I was thinking about coming over here, and I was trying to run through all the examples that I could come up with. For example, um, the, the Patagonia f vests that everybody wears in Silicon Valley and Wall Street. Patagonia will not partner with companies that, that aren't B Corps, that aren't out there to do good anymore. You have to be approved to co-brand a Patagonia vest these days. Uh, we've seen advertisers leaving Laura Ingram's show. Um, Goldman Sachs came out and said that they won't IPO anybody who, um, who doesn't have females on their boards. Um, Citibank won't bank um, gun sales. There, there's all these values added on top of of capitalism now, which is where I'm seeing this realignment of values. And, and that's mm. one of the things that, that I was thinking about in terms of if we're looking at the economy, is it just the numbers or is it this extra layer? The business roundtable now is saying it's not just shareholders, it's stakeholders. Yeah, but Doug, how would you respond to the argument that corporate social responsibility or woke capitalism is a way to soften the hard edges of capitalism? Well, it's not clear to me that corporations are good at that. I mean, there's, I think, a very real argument for an independent sector, for charity, for a whole set of institutions and attitudes of people in terms of trying to deal with that. It's not clear to me that companies, I mean, especially when you're spending other people's money, I mean, it's, it's frankly, it's easy to do that. Um, I, I think one of the, the, the problems here is in certain ways you're seeing more of the break between elite and common. That is, who wears Patagonia vests? It's not laboring people. It's not working people for the most part. I mean, who buys that? This is an high-end upper, you know, so in many ways it's very easy for Patagonia to kind of do this sort of thing, and that's wonderful. You know, but my sister who's divorced, who you know, doesn't make an awful lot of money, who lives in Montana, is not likely to shop at Patagonia. I mean, she's going to shop at Walmart. You know, so, and yet the elites complain about Walmart because it destroys other businesses, but for her this is... I mean, so I think <coughs> th th that's it. This is one of those cleavages where I think you're seeing, in many ways, Republicans and Democrats at a higher level moving together, and, and at the lower. I mean, so it's it's this is where you're kind of breaking the traditional alliances and you're revamping mm -hmm. voting patterns. I think the question here is, do they survive? That is, it matters a lot. Does Trump get reelected? I mean, if he's not reelected, then it strikes me suddenly this looks. I mean, even though I think the underlying passions are still there and the issues are still there it suggests maybe the re political realignment isn't as secure. You know, look at Italy, <laughs> the five-star movement has essentially disappeared. I mean, they got smashed in the last election, they're still in the national government, but they were the anti-establishment <coughs> forces who were in coalition with Salvini on the right, you know, that broke apart. It looks like this movement will probably dissipate. What follows, does it move back to establishment? Is there a new, you know, kind of populist movement that comes, we don't know. So I think some of these, are they enduring? And I think to me that's going to be the real test. Does some, what follows Trump is, Pom, I mean, Pompeo doesn't have, I don't think Pompeo resonates. He may desire that. I mean, I happen to think he's an awful Secretary of State, but that's not really the issue here. The point is, who follows Trump? Who can make the same appeal? It's not Pence. I think Pence is a decent human being, but hardly Donald Trump in appeal. So this is going to be the interesting, can you move beyond, who, who beyond J Johnson? I mean, he had a unique appeal. You know, is there a Tory who can follow him? I, I, and I think that's going to be our test. Is it a permanent realignment or is it kind of the flash that starts moving back? You know, if Labor nominates somebody who has more appeal, if the you know, Democrats nominate somebody who has more appeal and can talk to the working classes, then maybe this realignment suddenly doesn't prove to be as permanent as we thought. Okay, well now it's time for uh, questions and we'll get one right from the back. Emily, just your hand up. Yep, sorry, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you for um, coming here and listening to you. My question is, what do you think would be a, I think that Donald Trump, his biggest strength he feels is on foreign policy. And do you think, particularly with rising tensions in Iran, do you think he could make a rash decision that could potentially backfire in upcoming election. I was wondering if you could give some thoughts, particularly look at the rising tension. Stephen Loosley. If I could actually see a Trump foreign policy, I could give a coherent answer. <laughs> uh, it, is, uh, it is a matter of uh, decisions being made uh, on the run. For example, uh, 
uh, Khamenei in a Iran uh, releases an insulting tweet saying that Trump can't do anything uh, about the circumstances uh, existing in the Middle East, that appears to have been the determinant in the killing and the drone strike of Soleimani. And no, no thinking through the consequences. Um, a former United States ambassador to Australia said to me at a conference in Washington a couple of years ago, Stephen, this is not a president who majored in history. <laughs> so, so there's not that, uh, uh, that, uh, that balance of thinking through uh, what uh, might occur as a consequence of certain decisions over foreign policy and, and national security. And for Australian allies, uh, for, for our allies in the US and Australia's role as an ally of the US, that can be problematic. For example, Trump has twice announced that the US is out of Syria. Twice that's been reversed. And the pattern has become quite familiar in these foreign policy tweets. And by the way, Carl Bernstein once made the observation of Richard Nixon that the real Nixon is to be found on the White House tapes. That is Richard Milhouse Nixon. The real Donald J. Trump is to be found in his tweets. Unbridled, unfiltered. So you have uh, uh, circumstances with the, the tweeting and so on and so forth. We're out of Syria. So what does the Australian Embassy in Washington, D.C. do? And I think Joe Hockey and his predecessor, Kim Boozy, have both done terrific jobs. So the Australians go into the State Department and the Pentagon and they say, hey, look, we're not saying anything publicly. We're not complaining. But the president really blindsided us on this. You know, we have our troops there. We have our assets there. We've worked very closely with you. And the answer comes back from State and the Pentagon. Oh, we understand we were blindsided too. We'll take a question very soon, but following on from Steve and Doug, uh, Trump and his America First strategy did resonate with a significant segment of war-weary Americans. They're tired of the world, they're suffering from foreign policy fatigue. If Bernie Sanders is a Dem Democrat candidate, and remember, Sanders voted no to George H.W. Bush's Gulf War. He voted no to George W. Bush's Iraq War. No to NAFTA. No to GATT. If in a general debate, could you see a Bernie Sanders attacking Trump from an America First platform? No, I mean, Sanders could very well attack Trump for not following through on his promises. I think he gained votes on foreign policy. Hillary Clinton you know, is, a, is, the Repo is the Democratic neoconservative. She's for every war the US has gotten into, and, other, and she wanted to start others that uh, we didn't get into. The, I mean, if you want to see Hillary Clinton at her worst on foreign policy, you go to YouTube and look up the interview where she was asked about Muammar Gaddafi. And her response was, we came, we saw, and he died. And then she starts laughing. 2011. It a, it's a very creepy laugh. I mean, it's the sort of thing where, oh, wow. I mean, and the, boy, that one's turned out well. Nine years later, the Civil War continues to go on. Isn't this a wonderful accomplishment? Indeed, the example that everyone points to <laughs> Where, I mean, I've been to North Korea twice. You know, why would the North Koreans ever want to give up their nuclear weapons? Muammar Gaddafi, the idiot, gives up his nukes and missiles and the U.S. and Europeans take him out. Oh, boy. <laughs> that's, a, that's a reassuring thought for a dictator who's on America's naughty list. Uh, you know, so, and that was, she was the architect of that policy and, and very much the Syrian debacle of wanting to get rid of Assad and also go after ISIS but help the Al-Qaeda affiliate throw the Russians out, they've been allied with Syria for 50 years, never mind, work with the Kurds, it, it actually believe the Turks would accept. I mean, a policy that was utterly mindless. He ran against her and called, essentially called her a warmonger, and I think it brought him votes. I think he's hurt by not really having followed through. Sanders can make that case. Iran, is the, I think, shows the inconsistency of his thinking. You know, he is utterly, you know, fanatically anti-Iran. Now, trying to understand exactly why is hard. I think part of it's Israel and the Saudis. And for some reason, he loves the Saudis. That, uh, he criticized them in the campaign, but, I mean, his lips are attached to, you know, MBS's, uh, you know, rear end. I mean, it's extraordinary, the American policy. You can slice and dice an American resident and journalist, and it doesn't bother the American government at all. I mean, I, I, mean, I was on panels with Hamal Khashoggi. I, I met him and had lunch with him. You know, the, so 
it's a weird, there's stuff in the foreign policy, I mean, the tweets, there's stuff there that affects the decision making that's very hard. But to the extent that Trump and Sanders' views prevail, doesn't that represent a repudiation of the notion of American global leadership that we've experienced since the end of World War II? Garana. Well, it's certainly the sort of liberal internationalist slash neoconservative consensus that emerged as a result of the fall of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War, has been challenged by both sides of the, the politics, that's clear. Um, on that question on, on, you, on Donald Trump's foreign policy track, um, I think it will play out different for who you ask if you ask Trump supporters. He's acting decisively, you know, he's taking out... Soleimani, but then he is restraining. This is kind of sending a deterrent signal, even though it's a kind of weird deterrent to send because the ball is now sort of in Iran's court and this maximum pressure thing. You know, we've seen sanctions being applied on Cuba for well over half a century, not really kind of making much difference in affecting behavior change. But on the other hand, you have Democrats for whom President Trump's every move is taken as impulsive rather than decisive. And this is where, where the, the main divide lies, um, in my opinion, at least. And I think when it comes to just the, the sort of narrative that President Trump is pulling out of these endless wars, that he is withdrawing U.S. true presence, for instance, in the Middle East, that's frankly not supported by facts. If anything, Donald Trump now, uh, with the sort of... Uh, the, the, action that, that the actions that he has taken in Iran, not just this year, but over the past year or two, uh, has increased the number of troops that have been deployed to the Middle East. That's something that, again, Bernie Sanders or someone on the Democratic side could well uh, use against him. And he's actively going against everything that uh, his national security strategy and national defense strategy has have identified as main uh, challenges moving forward. Firstly, China, the kind of return of the great power rivalry, and to an extent Russia, even though they are not the same beast. So... Um, it's very, you know, he is a unilateralist. He doesn't believe in multilateralism in international institution. He's, he has definitely done the most sort of damage to this idea of the liberal international order, but it's a very, very patchy record and one where he is actively going against things that he himself has been... April Pomeroy. I was just going to say that one of the things that we haven't touched on up here, except in that last comment by Garana, is China. He has really taken on China, and when I'm back in D.C., that has bipartisan support. Mm -hmm. I think that there is broad agreement that China has been doing the wrong thing for a long time, and somebody had to do something about it. And so I'm hearing the same message from both sides of the aisle when I'm in Washington, that that was the right step to take. And whether or not he's, he's crafted, whether phase one is, is the right direction and, and we're going in the right way with China, I think there was support for the actions that he took there. Professor Bruce McKern. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, ask the panel if we can go back to the election for a moment. Um, uh, there hasn't been any discussion about uncommitted voters or the, the, uh, the independents. And uh, 10 years ago, the, these people were regarded as, as quite important. Um, what's happened to them? Are, are, they, are they very few now? And what, what do you think about their intentions? Well, there are fewer. The polls that I've seen have suggested that they are probably somewhat pro-Trump, though not overwhelmingly so. I mean, Trump, with the Electoral College, Trump can win with, say, 48% of the vote or something. I mean, it's, so he needs some independence. I mean, his problem, and I think, again, a, I, I, he could win, I think, if he just tempered some of his excesses. He could still be confrontational, still be the populist champion, without being extraordinarily offensive to everybody. And I think that would bring in, among other things, more independence. That he's, we got moderate Republicans, suburban women, independents. There is folks there who don't really want to vote Democratic, but it's him as a person that really pushes them away. But independents, at least in a, in a moderate way, do seem to have moved back towards him it's not overwhelming, and he needs them. You know, I mean, he could lose them by November. And again, I think the Demo name of the Democratic nominee matters a lot here. The, in terms of that relative appeal, I think Sanders, very hard for a lot of independents to vote for. I think Biden, a lot of them certainly could vote for. Stephen Leasley. Oh, just a brief observation. In 2016, the American national electorate divided three ways, 40% registered Democrats, 30% registered Republicans, 30% independents. I haven't seen any more recent figures, but it's, it's fair to assume they remain very significant and Trump will need some of those votes in order to get across 
the line and part of the Republican campaign is going to need to tailor and th that's where I think I, I take the point that was just made. I think that's where Biden probably has the strongest claim on the Democratic uh, nomination. John Connor. Yeah, um, question really, uh, first of all, a very quick observation. I've been in and around the US for about 60 years. I've never known it to be more divided in all sorts of ways. Where so many issues, so many people, average people, ordinary sort of people, feel confronted by more issues a day than I've ever known. And I think they are in a constant state of discombobulation. And out of that seems to me to arise a need for a leader. And people, people, many of the people who vote for Trump, working class people and what have you, dismiss criticisms on the basis that at least he seems to know where he's going, however stupid that may be. Frankly, I don't see a single one of the principal Democratic contenders capable of, of offering the sort of near evangelical leadership that would be required to be president. Uh, John Connor on the toxic polarisation in Washington, April. Yeah, I, I was looking at a poll and 82% of Republicans say the Democratic Party has been taken over by socialists. 80% of Democrats say the Republican Party has been taken over by racists. In Tom's office just before, we were talking about how Kansas City is in Missouri, and we were talking about former leaders from Missouri. There was a senator from Missouri named Jack Danforth, who was moderate Republican, and he had the exact same voting record as a moderate Democrat named Lloyd Benson, who ran as, as vice president. We don't have any of that overlap anymore. The voters are rewarding people who move to the extremes, people who do not compromise. Those are the ones who are getting support and getting reelected. And so I think that you're exactly right. There isn't that call from the public for a leader who's uniting. We, we hear Biden talking the talk that he wants to bring us all back together, but I don't see the electorate getting there yet. And, and the understanding that Trump has with his base, that he, he's real, that you can, you can believe what he says, it's not being filtered through spokesmen, is appealing to, to his base. And I think that's, that's where the Democrats aren't cutting through. They don't trust the elitist um, lifelong politicians. Stephen Loosley, what did you tell me late last year on the ABC's Radio National about this election being the most divisive, polarising, vicious campaign since when? 1800. Uh, <laughs> Please which, explain. Which is the benchmark for American elections in the same way that 1840 is the benchmark for American presidential campaigns becoming circuses, at least in, uh, in part. In 1800, the election of, uh, of Jefferson, uh, the alternative candidate Pinckney uh, and Jefferson's campaigns, and this was mainly done by pamphlets, ladies and gentlemen, it was the social media of the age. The pamphlet campaigns alleged treason and murder against the respective candidates, thus opening the opportunity for Colonel Aaron Burr who'd been an officer in the Revolutionary Army and was technically Jefferson's running mate. The system was different uh, then. If the running mate polled more votes than the presidential candidate, well, he assumed the, uh, uh, the, the, the win for the presidency. Burr tried to steal the election in the House of Representatives. But the campaign itself was characterised by unrestrained viciousness in terms of what the parties and the candidates were saying uh, about uh, about each other. And I think if Trump is under pressure and he can see the polls showing him a few points behind, there will be absolutely no restraint on what he says. I mean, we have examples of, of what he has said to date. And, and so, sometimes that can be uh, very effective. Sometimes it's just brutally offensive. And, and a, Fox, uh, a Fox interview with one of their charming host uh, the other, just the other night, Trump introduced his list of abusive nicknames for his potential opponents. So it, it, it's, it's already I mean, uh, polarisation clearly goes both ways, Stephen. I yes, mean, the, the it, Democrats and the Liberals and, yes, and the, the, the things they say on MSNBC, to be fair. Yes, it does. And I'm, I'm out at the University of Iowa at a Buttigieg rally and one of the Buttigieg people is asking a question and she prefaces it by saying... Of course, I'd rather vote for a potato than Donald Trump. And that was met with cheers. 
So you have this very, very deep divide. But what is different, Tom, is that the current President of the United States focuses on that and tries to make the divisions worse. Um, since we're speaking about this political polarisation divisions, if somebody of the hard left like Bernie Sanders was to be nominated president, how likely would that perhaps be trigger a potential second civil war within the states? <laughs> that just might be the beer talking. <laughs> mm. uh, one was enough. <laughs> <laughs> Doug Vandau. Oh, I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, after 750,000 dead back in the 1860s, I don't think that's, there's going to be a rerun. Um, I think that the divisions are very, very deep. I don't think there's violence behind them. But certainly one worries a very close election with contested results in several states could get very ugly. I mean, that's what I think it would take. And it, it'd be a political dispute. It'd be a judicial dispute. Uh, then there, people would argue over the legitimacy of the judges making the decisions. I mean, one can imagine. I mean, there were certainly Democrats who didn't accept George W. Bush's you know, victory after the, you know, the and in fact, the, the media did, uh, actually got a hold of the disputed ballots and counted them in various ways, and they found that in almost every way, in fact, Bush did get more votes in Florida. That he, I mean, it was actually properly decided, despite you know, the, the craziness of people looking at hanging chads and stuff. Um, but I think it's, to me, the biggest issue is legitimacy, that we've gone through where basically Republicans, and this I think where a lot of the, the polarization started, Republicans treated Clinton is illegitimate based upon what he did in the Oval Office, and it was disgusting, but you know, they, they treated it as much more than that. Democrats viewed George W. Bush as being illegitimate. You know, he didn't really win the election, he stole it. Republicans then argued <laughs> Barack Obama's illegitimate, he's not born in America, I mean, ludicrous stuff. But what you, what you found was a delegitimization of the other side, where, I mean, I worked for Ronald Reagan. Reagan would get together with Tip O'Neill, who was Speaker of the U.S. House. O'Neill represented a very left-wing district in Massachusetts. The, the Democrats controlled the House of Representatives. Reagan had to deal with them. They would attack each other politically, but they'd sit down and have a drink off hours. They'd play a round of golf. They would talk because they understood both were legitimate leaders, elected constitutional officers of the United States who had to work together. They were both patriots. They didn't demonize their opponent. They understood that these people... You know, and to me, that was the difference that today it's very hard to get that respect for the opposition. It's much easier to say, well, they're not real, they're not legitimate, they're not patriots. They, you know. And to me, that's the danger, I think, is you get a continued delegitimization. of Whichever candidate would win, the other side is going to have an incentive to say it wasn't right, it wasn't proper. And that, I think, is a we, we are running out of time. One more question, maybe another one. Uh, yes, one, one uh, aspect we haven't really covered, uh, Stephen mentioned uh, briefly about Nikki Haley. Um, Donald Trump can be a bit of an oaf, a bit of a Celeste Patterson of American politics, but he sort of gets things done. But for every ugly magician, you need an even more glamorous assistant to even up the odds. What is your, Doug and Steve, opinion about the running mate for Donald Trump? Would he be better off with a Nikki Haley who's got some sort of poise, intellect, femininity, all the qualities to sort of balance Minority. off the Trump. Nikki, Nikki Haley's not silly enough to run as Trump's running mate. She's focused on 2024. And Mike Pence is very important to Trump in terms of uh, evangelical Christians. And uh, I think we will see Trump Pence as the Republican ticket again. I, I think that Trump really values loyalty and Pence has been absolutely loyal. Uh, so from Trump's standpoint, he'd be taking a very real risk to go to somebody else. Actually, I'm not convinced. If Nikki Haley was offered the vice presidency and thought that Trump was going to win, I think she'd take it because it would position her for the next time. Uh, but I don't think he's going to offer. I mean, I think Pence will be you know, chosen again. I just it's like me for Trump. Trump values that. I mean, Pence is absolutely loyal, says nothing, no criticism, and that matters. I mean, he, he affirms. I mean, Trump, I think, wants affirmation more than power. If you affirm he's a mo the genius and a fabulous person, you know, that gets you a lot more than anything else, and I think that he gets that. The, reason, the reason I disagree with Doug on Nikki Haley is look at the very dignified manner of her departure as UN ambassador, and that was mainly to put some distance between the current president and herself. Final question, Alex. Uh, Tom, we've talked about um, Sanders and Biden and some of the existing players. Um, 
Bloomberg, we haven't really mentioned that much. I mean, he's the guy with the checkbook. He's going to speak to the elite, the people that don't like the oath. Uh, he's going to speak to corporate America. Um, can, he, can he come over the top um, here and really take the centre ground and actually offer a viable alternative? Who can win? Briefly, April. He certainly has the money. Uh, but because he's not on the ballot in these first four states, he's relying on there not being a front runner by the time he gets to Super Tuesday when his money can really make a difference. He has name recognition in New York. It's not as strong in the rest of the country at this point. But he is the one who has the checkbook to go up against Trump and, and take the gloves off. And I think he, he could be a bit of a street fighter the way Trump is. But it all depends on what happens in these first few states. Biden could have it sewn up before March. Mike Bloomberg, uh, Doug Bandow. I think his problem is that he doesn't have left-wingers. Rather, he'll get, I mean, the, the Sanders crew, Warren and others, will hate him. He's a, a white billionaire who represents the corporate elite. He also has no common touch. I mean, I mentioned he's a cold fish. I mean, it doesn't mean he's a bad person, but in terms of... So I don't, it strikes me he offers intellect, he offers smarts. I don't think that decides American presidential elections. Gorana. Well, the best-case scenario that... Um, some envisage for Mike Bloomberg is for him to be the kingmaker at the convention. Um, should we come to Wisconsin and there's no one with the majority delegates that are pledged to that candidate, then if Bloomberg capitalizes on some of the delegates he might snatch in some of these states where he has been spending a lot of money and uh, where, I mean, just in terms of the intricacies of some of the primaries, he is supporting those candidates down the ballot who actually might pledge to uh, uh, go for him, and in this scenario, he could have a lot of sway on uh, the way the um, the whole process of Stephen Leslie goes. The money does not talk in politics; it screams. But <laughs> there are there are limitations. Now, Bloomberg's strategy was tried by Rudy Giuliani on the Republican <laughs> side in two thousand and eight. He fell flat on his face. That could easily happen again. Bloomberg set aside an estimated $200 million for the campaign out of his own pocket. The great difference between uh, Trump and Bloomberg in material terms is that Bloomberg actually is a billionaire. Uh, he's been close to Vice President Biden for a long time. And it may be uh, it, a kingmaker in Milwaukee if the, the result is not clear. But if, say, Joe Biden has emerged as the Democratic nominee, the putative Democratic nominee, I suspect uh, Bloomberg is likely to sit back and write some big checks and, and sustain the Democratic campaign. And to think we've got nine months to go. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please thank April Parmalee, Doug Bandow, Gorana Gorchik, and Stephen Loosley. <laughs>